Good morning. Welcome to our conversation here today, um, which we're going to be launching the Africa Community Internet Program. My name is Yusuf Abdul-Kadir. I'm an adjunct faculty at Syracuse University, and I have an amazing set of folks here with me today in person and online. Last night, uh, we opened up our conversations here at the UN Internet Governance Forum in Kyoto, and thank you to the people of Japan and the government of Japan uh, for inviting us and welcoming us uh, to Japan, arigato. Last night's conversation was situated and oriented around making sure we leave no one behind. It is essential that as we consider the expansion of the internet and uh, think through how we're going to ensure inclusion that we are keen and clear to leave no one behind. The folks here today are going to be talking a bit about community networks and how we can both manifest um, the re realization of an, of an open, inclusive internet and making sure that the availability of what we all have referred to as the information highway uh, is accessible uh, and that technologies uh, being one of the key advantages to make community networks available uh, is, is, is helpful to advance these issues. We've got a number of folks in the room and online, uh, so we're going to begin today in multi approaches. First, we're going to have some presentations and case studies from Dr. Lee McKnight and graduate student, doctoral student, Jane Apiochere. Um, and then we'll have a discussion with folks here and online. We're going to begin with Dr. McKnight. Thank you, uh, Yusuf. Uh, thank you uh, to Japan, our hosts, and all of you here in the room and online for joining us for this important discussion. The Africa Community Internet Program was introduced in uh, 2022 at the Addis Ababa IGF in Ethiopia last year, and we have made progress with our partners. Uh, I am a professor at Syracuse University, as is my colleague, Professor Smith, there, and uh, we have been working with the Africa Open Data and Internet Research Foundation to launch the Africa Community Internet Program. Next slide, please. Oh, I should do it. Oh, way back one. Oh, mm -hmm. let's see, here we are. Okay, so what are we, why are we here? It's because over, well, around 2.6 billion people do not have access to the internet in 2023. We've, in the last year, in 2022, we moved the dial, 100 million people. We can go faster, we can do better than that. Uh, go back, okay, I'm sorry. Um, how we, we can do that, it's actually not that hard. In fact, right here in the room is something that could connect 2.6 billion people if it was just distributed around uh, the world without any new infrastructure. Uh, it's called the Internet Backpack. It powers community networks. And uh, if we're folks here in the room and are welcome to come check us out at the Africa Community Internet Program booth in the exhibit hall after this panel. But it really is as simple as one, two, three, one, two, three, connect, and you're online from everywhere except the North and South Poles. And we don't, and people in, it's, we, we don't need exper experts to go into any of these communities. People, internet backpack operators can, are people in the community that if they know how to run a smartphone, they can figure this out. We launched, as I mentioned, the program in 2022. Uh, we have now increased dialogue with uh, 16, 17, 18 African nations in cooperation with the United Nations Economic Co uh, Commission for Africa, African uh, Union, African Telecommunications Union, many nonprofits, increasingly several firms and um, government agencies you know, in both Africa, your, the US, and elsewhere, and our hope and intent is to have at least some initial dialogue with all African Union member nations by the time of the G20 summit in 2025. This is not a imported innovation. The key software that is patented in 2022 is uh, really an invention of a really brilliant guy in the Democratic Republic of Congo that's been working on this for six years, along with several of us at Syracuse University, elsewhere, and a firm called Imcon International, which is not the point of this presentation. 
what is the point of this presentation is to say we can do this. This is not rocket science. To my right is uh, Jane Coffin when she was with Internet Society for many years saying this is not rocket science. We can build community networks. We can do this. And now we tried to make it simpler and easier and faster to at least get started with a little internet. So we, that's with the Africa Community Internet Program. It's part of the Africa and Global Community Internet Program. What we say is everyone deserves at least a sip of internet. So that's how you pronounce it, a sip of internet. Okay, but it's, we go faster, easier, and better if governments cooperated. And we have recommendations. We have a white paper that is being, being released here online for the first time that has been shared, again, with UN agencies and governments for quite some time over the past year since we initiated this last year. Again, um, Internet Society and national governments have begun to authorize and permit community networks so that people can fill the gap for connectivity themselves uh, without the barriers in place favoring the incumbent carriers. We think this can all be done and we can get going immediately and there really isn't an excuse not to do it. And I'll stop on that note, thank you. We're gonna now go to doctoral student Jane Apiocheri. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so it's always good to think about uh, what legacy we, the older adults, are leaving behind for the younger generation behind us, especially the ones in rural areas. Um, kids born in rural areas did not decide to be born over there, but they are born over there, and um, there's nothing we can do about it. All we can do is to help them to be able to grow up and become uh, citizens that can produce, citizens that can help. And so my research that I'm doing, it's about providing internet connectivity in rural areas, and it's in Ghana. We first train teachers so that the teachers can train the kids. And um, when we did the research, um, we had teachers come to a library where, as Dr. McKnight said, we have the internet backpack that you see over there. We put it in that rural area where they don't have any internet connectivity. We turn it on, set it up, and there was internet access for the teacher professional development that we did. We trained the teachers, and now, through the for about four months, a year from now, I mean last year, the teachers have been using the internet, and guess what, the numbers that we have is, now the children are the one coming to the library. Now, if the internet backpack was not provided, was not there to provide internet access, yes, the kids will come to the library to read books, but they would not be able to research and find other resources online. Some of the teachers were very happy because they are able to download videos because their classrooms, they don't have electricity, not alone internet. And so they download videos, take it to their classrooms and show it to the kids. And then give the kids assignments and the kids will come to the library, do the research and present whatever they've learned. And they're seeing amazing improvement in the children's um, education. Um, we also looked at, uh, I also look at the, um, the, the gender aspect of it. When the internet backpack or internet access was provided, we saw that a lot of girls were using the internet as it's supposed to be, and not that the boys were not, but the girls were really there. But as time progresses, we saw that the girls were not always there, but the boys were using the internet, which is something that we hope to investigate more and find out what is preventing our girls from using the internet. Another aspect that we saw was the, the social connection of having the internet in the centralized location in the community. The community had five schools. And these five schools all come to the library. And so when we did the teacher professional devo development, the teachers were able to come together, private school teachers, public school teachers, come together and find out that, oh, we have somebody who knows more about the internet. Let's be friends so that we can come together, learn, and sometimes invite you to come to my classroom and uh, teach my kids. So we see that the social connection that having these resources in the library brought 
it's really helping the teachers. It's bringing them together to train our kids. And also the kids are learning, are able to perform um, exercises that the teachers found that it was difficult for the kids to research and work on. And so we will see a big impact in providing access to the internet to rural communities or rural and underserved communities whereby there's no infrastructure and there's no way that uh, our governments are going to be able to build these infrastructures all the way. And just picking up the backpack, taking it to that rural area made a big impact in this research. And I'm pretty sure that if we are able to, um, as Dr. McKnight said, distribute the backpack where they don't have internet, these kids that are born there will be able to participate in the digital environment. Thank you. Okay, so now that we've kind of laid the floor into how we're going to approach the conversation, I want to set a few key discussion points for those who will be here with us today, uh, those of us in the audience, and those who will be joining us online. There are three thematic areas that we're going to try to situate our conversation in. we got limited time, but we want to make sure to try to get you all the best amount of access to information as possible. First, uh, the solution to rural community infrastructure and electricity. Two, bridging the digital skills gap and expanding training needs. And three, why funding for community networks and sustainable energy is necessary. So the panelists here will try to address those three topical areas as we kind of continue uh, our discussion here. For those who are in the room, please do not hesitate to come to the mics. There are two in the room if you have any questions. We'll be, we want to have a dialogue with you as opposed to a uh, lecturer Many of us are academics, and so we, we're used to <laughs> those kinds of conversations. But we're actually here in trying to build a conversation and build a collective, cohesive group of folks trying to expand internet access to communities that don't have access. So if you do have questions, please don't hesitate. Go to the mic. We'll make sure to bring you into the discussion. To kick us off here, Dr. McKnight, uh, I think it's kind of important for us to orient the conversation in not just um, ensuring that no one's left behind, which is key and essential, but how the backpack's design itself tries to facilitate for that. Can you talk a bit about the backpack's design and the way that you've thought through ensuring access to internet, access to electricity and beyond? Sure, uh, thank you for that, uh, Yusuf. <clears throat> so I, I, when we call the internet backpack a connectivity tool, we're only talking about part of the pack uh, it's also a very small microgrid, a solar-powered microgrid with a solar panel uh, that's foldable and a battery that with, uh, with uh, eight hours of uh, sunlight, you can sort of recharge all the electronics in the pack and keep going. So it's sustainable connectivity off-grid. If, of course, you can plug it into the uh, utility grid, great, then you can recharge everything faster. If you have a car battery that you can charge, plug it into, that's also fine. But by design, we do not assume you have access to any source of electricity so that this can keep people connected indefinitely anywhere with or without access to a grid. Obviously, it'd be better if you did have access, if you did have access to reliable electricity from another source, but this is, does it by design, not, does not make that assumption. It assumes maybe you need it, maybe you don't. Another aspect is how do you connect? Uh, you could connect by Wi-Fi, that would be nice, right? We like Wi-Fi, oh, we all do. It's cheap, fast, unlicensed spectrum, pretty good service, you're all on it right now. If you don't have that, uh, 4G, 5G, that can be really fast off the pack. You, and that we have designed so that we're sort of by design, we're assuming up to about 25 people, up to 250 devices can be connected off one pack. We're not guaranteeing that all the, they can all get recharged. <clears throat> we can recharge what comes with the pack overnight. Uh, but still, 25 people, a simultaneous users. So this is simultaneous, not like total. Jane, Jane's numbers are, exceed the professor's guidelines, but that's that's actually that shows it, and it don't not with still decent performance. So again, this is a sip of internet. This is not a gigabit per person guaranteed from a fiber, but you get some internet from it. So to summarize, it's a microgrid. It's a connectivity tool. Oh, I forgot to mention satellite. Uh, in case you can't connect to 4G or 5G and you can't connect to Wi-Fi, there's a satellite internet capacity built in. 
currently we're using VGAN. That will be swapped out to another solution in the next upgrade, I understand, from the manufacturer. Oh, and if you can't do any of that, and you really want to connect, we have like a mesh networking for sending emergency communication signals to somebody within the next two, four, five, or 10 kilometers away. So in some, the whole like design is like one way or another you have energy, one way or another you can connect, and everybody can connect everywhere with that one little pack, except the North and South Pole, just because of Inmarsat satellites. So um, anyway, so that's the design. It's a complex, complete little system with a, careful energy balance to make it sustainable indefinitely with, with, uh, with or without access to the energy grid. Jane Coffin, you have a storied career, respected in this space, and I wanna get you an opportunity to kind of talk with us a bit about the way that community networks, and we talked a bit about that last night, but, but for those who weren't here, the way that community networks can kind of expand access and try to build this infrastructure. Uh, Jane comes to us as a senior executive uh, with uh, on international infrastructure and internet issues. Uh, so Jane, please. Yes, thank you very much, and thank you to our host, uh, the government of Japan and uh, colleagues in Japan. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, uh, community networks are a way to help build out middle mile, last mile connectivity, sometimes first mile, it depends on the type of community network. Um, the proof that community networks are working is the great work that you see APC, the Internet Society, organizations like yours, um, FCDO, GIZ funding, other de uh, development organizations understanding that traditional forms of connectivity have not connected um, many of our communities in urban, rural, remote, unserved and underserved areas. I'm being specific about urban as well. If you go to Nairobi, you will find that in very strong urban settings, um, you find POA there, a, a small ISP that's doing amazing work. You find Community Network uh, there um, from Tunapanda. They've changed the name, and I can't remember the name. Carlos may remember, he's in the room. Um, but community networks are a way from the community out to build infrastructure. And I'm gonna focus on uh, a word that I hope you remember, uh, local, local training, which means training local people to train local people for sustainability. We're not talking about people jetting in to just um, leave and not leave the training behind. Um, digital skills are so important. It's something I think we've all found when we're doing work with communities, whether it's the um, Rise America, Altur Mundi in Latin America, and in uh, Africa you have lots of different community networks. Some that come to mind are Zenzeleni, um, Tunapanda, and others. Uh, that are trying, and AFCHIX doing great work, another group. And it's about that local training, whether it's technical training. AFCHIX is a term that the women in a group gave themselves when they were part of a network operator group, the NOGS. If you haven't heard of them, ask me about them later. Network operator groups are really important for technical training. And this is a women's group of women training each other in a comfortable setting. So you've got the key technical training that goes on, the community development training, which is equally important from a digital skills perspective. And um, local grant making training is super important. Anyone who's done this work can tell you, you've got to go out and find that funding. The key thing is there are ways to talk to investors as well to get that funding into your community. It's largely about ensuring them that you're going to help them de-risk their investment, whether it's philanthropic funding, capital coming from uh, commercial entities and banks and others. But there are ways to do this, and I would like to posit that we can decolonialize funding. And we can do this and create more funds. And I know there are some folks um, who are thinking of setting up more funds in Sub-Saharan for connectivity. I won't get into all of that right now because I think the, some of them are still in progress. But if you also look at the, the UN Giga project with ITU and UNICEF, they're trying very hard to focus on how to bring more funding and funds into Sub-Saharan Africa and around the world later but to build out these community networks. But if you've not heard of them before, come talk to the people here on the podium. Carlos, who's in the audience here, and some others, the folks at Kicktonet are running around. I think they can also help. Uh, Josephine uh, Melisa, who also works uh, in Kibera in Nairobi on many projects, but also is the lead for APC in Africa on the community networks work. And I know that Ultramundi is here as well. Um, so they're from Latin America, mostly Argentina, doing work and I think Rhizomatica, but I can't remember. Anyway, important that you're looking at 
talking to regulators and policymakers as well. As Dr. Lee had mentioned, there's a sp something called spectrum, which is very important <laughs> if you're trying to put a network together. And you need to ensure that you talk to your regulators and policymakers if you're trying to use licensed spectrum. But the Wi-Fi networks are generally using that unlicensed spectrum in 2.45, sometimes 6 gigahertz, which those are geeky things that you don't have to remember. Just know that if that's not unlicensed in the country that you're working in, you need to figure out how to talk to the regulators about using that spectrum. But in many countries, it's unlicensed. You do need to know some of the people who know more about this from the technical perspective, and there are many of them out there. Again, I've mentioned some earlier. I'll stop talking and turn it back no, to you. No, that, that was amazing, Jane. I think it helps to kind of transition perfectly to a colleague of ours, Kwaku Antwi, who's the Director of Programs and Outreach for the Africa Open Data and Internet Research Foundation, AODERF. Kwaku, are you here with us online? I believe you are. I'm right here, Yusuf. Hello, everybody. It's, it's, it's as if the voice of God has come to us in the room. It's always great hearing you, Kwaku. Kwaku, if you could please talk a bit about the way that AODERF is trying to both engage regulators, members of parliament, and communities. I think oftentimes we talk about digitalizing the grassroots. It's the name of our white paper. But why is it key to try to build this part of the internet from the grassroots up? Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Jane, great to have you on board. Um, such a such a big steps to follow. But anyway, thank you so much. Um, so basically, it's important that um, we empower the people with the skill set to be able to set up, just like the backpack is easy to set up, but most importantly, to engage the policymakers who make the laws, who um, are able to um, um, authorize the use of the equipment according to the regulations, according to the set rules, and most importantly also to engage the, the policymakers from the parliament to be able to transition their thinking and also aligning with the lawmaking so that it's easier to transition our technologies. Community networks are something which are kind of a new phenomenon, but it's quite easy to understand the concept. Um, I think Jane just, um, Jane Coffin just broke it down a bit for us, but um, we're empowering the people to be able to be empowered to be more sustainable, okay? So once we have the networks in place, we believe that the skill sets, the innovation needs to stay in the community. If the innovation stays in the community, we need to have laws or regulators who also understand that this is a bit different from the big telecommunications networks or the ISPs who operate on a higher level who require big capital. Most of our communities that we are looking to digitalize, these are the grassroots communities also have needs to be able to connect it. And I believe um, Jane Apiotris research and other deployed parts in Costa Rica and across the world where the community and the backpack has been deployed shows us that one, the people themselves in the, in the rural communities need to be skilled enough. Our, uh, our regulators need to be able to do it. That's what African Open Data and Internet Research Foundation we are doing across Africa. We have our network of um, regional regulators as well as um, policy makers and in the IGF space, the NRIs, and also our network of other internet connecting um, organizations that we strengthen ourselves meet regularly and also share our experience where we're able to improve the network and make sure that our grassroots communities are digitalized, skilled, and also knowledgeable about the policies and regulations who are able to improve it for their own benefits from the bottom up. Thank you. Awesome. So we are really excited about the opportunity to both engage in conversation and dialogue, but to do something special here today. Uh, last year, we introduced the world to this concept of the internet backpack. Actually, uh, Dr. Smith, if you would be as kind as to raise your hand, um, Dr. Smith is here in the audience. Uh, you'll see the internet backpack to the left of her, so if folks in the room are interested in coming, you can take a seat, you can see it, you can engage with it, you can touch it, you can feel it. Um, but we're this year going to try to launch another uh, opportunity to connect with our website. 
So as Dr. McKnight mentioned, the website is a SIP, but just for those of us who may not uh, be able to spell that, it's A-G-C-I-P dot O-R-G. Um, and please take a moment to go to the website for those of us joining from around the world online and those in person. Uh, you, can, you can check out the website and, we, and we'll be happy to put it on the screen in a moment or two. For the last few moments that we have, I want to make sure that there are any questions in the audience, and if there aren't, uh, I, I want to try to round us out with, with a few key points about the importance of both engaging and discussion. Oh, we have a, a lovely person here in the audience who has a question. Uh, good morning. Yeah. Good Hi. morning. I'm Christine from Uganda. Uh, I work with the regulator there, Uganda Communications Commission. So I have a couple of questions. One of them on the sustainability angle. Uh, from our experience in the Universal Service Access Program that we run, uh, when you supply IT equipment and all, when it reaches its end of life, the communities look back and say, where do we take it? So how is this uh, project catering for that aspect of sustainability, e-waste? Uh, the other is to do with, uh, uh, I'm yet to interact with the full design and backpack, so you'll excuse me if it's already catered for, but nevertheless, I'll ask uh, operation and maintenance costs and support. Uh, Usually, also that comes in, in terms of the communities, uh, the technical support to actually, in case there's a failure with a backpack, who is going to handle it, and is that catered for in the, in the training, away from the usage bit? And lastly, ownership. Um, we have seen that ownership of products by the communities, not only the beneficiaries, but also the communities associated with the beneficiaries uh, sort of helps uh, garner the support and sort of uh, the importance and significance of such beyond this was a donation that was brought. It's only for a few identified people in our community, but the, the way that others can also come around it. So how is that being factored in? Thank you. Amazing questions. Dr. Manette, I'm going to pass that to you. Um, thanks, and those are ex all excellent questions, and we don't pretend to have uh, firm answers to them all at this moment, but we'll sort of take them in part. So first on sustainability, there's a very large firm, which I cannot name yet, that we're in discussion with around issues of e-waste recycling and um, life cycle management of the pack and beyond. Because there's the pack, and once you have the pack, you might also want to have some laptops or other phones. So again, that's under discussion, uh, but not something that I can say, I can pretend we have a solution to right now. But we recognize that's important going forward. Second part is, well actually, the, the first part for the pack itself, from last year's uh, discussions in Addis Ababa, uh, there was strong support for having the pack come with a full warranty. So essentially there's always, if it's a warranty, you can just sort of send it back, right, uh, to, to the um, manufacturer. And then they have the, under US law, they would have the e-waste responsibilities um, for it. Um, that was one. What was, internet backpack operator? Uh, like who, who's actually managing this and who, how much training is needed. While I showed one slide with like one, two, three, one, two, three, we also have, and we, we have five like two minute videos in English and Spanish. Uh, that is really all you need to do to train an internet backpack operator. And an internet backpack operator is some member of the community who is either well, we, we went into Costa Rica, so we recognize like somebody has to own this and take responsibility for it for the community. So they don't actually, you know, they don't technically own it, but from a technical point of view, who's responsible for it, who's gonna, who's trying to make sure it's uh, safe and secure, um, and who's, who's, who's the best skilled at operating it. So when Professor Smith and I went into a rural community in Costa Rica, I think now two years ago, I was very curious, like how did they decide who was the internet backpack operator? you know, what was special about him? Well, he was, and the answer was he lived next to the school. 
Okay, so he was like, the spillover from the Wi-Fi signal went, covered the school, give it to him, and he was a member of like the local community board of some sort, but he didn't have any special skills. So again, literally, if you can operate a smartphone, you can operate the internet backpack, you can learn more and do more. Uh, offering further training and support for higher levels of management beyond just being like the local internet backpack operator. This is really a cloud to edge solution. So there's, you're man managing multiple different cloud services and designating things. That gets more complicated. True, uh, we have been working closely with the Internet Society. Jane was too modest to admit, like really it's her nudges along the way. Co before there was even one Internet backpack, we were talking, Jane and I, uh, before the first one was ever deployed to uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Since then, every step of the way, we've been interacting with Internet Society, local communities per country. So we would expect the Internet Society in that country to be part of like the backstopping technical support. Uh, similarly, ICANN, similarly, NRIs, and then there's, um, of course, local, so essentially, anyway, so we're, we don't have a magic solution per country. It would be something where the Uganda ISOC community would have to sort of step up a little bit to help provide solutions. Um, remote support. Syracuse University students are really good and have been helping, you know, they, literally you don't need anybody in the country. This is, this is what I'm saying, this is so simple. There's, we've this deployed into 20 countries where there aren't anybody from the manufacturer. There's nobody from Syracuse University there. We get access on the internet, we coach them, we debug it. So it's, it's designed to be that easy that you do not need that level of expertise unless you're trying to do these higher level Things. Now, if I'm trying to remember, oh, so, so um, was there, if there probably were a couple more questions there, but that's what I should probably stop rambling. Hello, my name is Nils Brock from DW Academy in Rysomatica. Um, I have a question. It sounds like a, a really great solution, like one fits for all. And uh, taking it uh, a look from another side when we talk about co-creation and community-centered design and where you sit together with persons and you would design solutions, maybe you would come up with more than one backpack, so to speak, and they could look different and they could be m uh, also owned by the community. So my question is a bit, um, uh, uh, a manufacturing, is this also like, a, is it a decentralized approach behind it? Because uh, as I understand, like shipping uh, devices can make up to 80% of the of the cost in some some cases, and then that's also the question: uh, if some component is broken in some countries, they might not be um, available, and it would be maybe better to to build up the technical solution also like locally in this sense to see what are uh, local manufacturers or fab labs or who could be involved. So yeah, like kind of this kind of thinking. Thank you. Super question. Um, I'm gonna take my moderator hat off for a moment um, and put on uh, the participant hat and then put it back on and go to Dr. McKnight. Um, you know, the intention has always been for this not to be oriented by what people in the West kind of coming onto the continent and saying, you need better, here you go. Uh, we're, we're really not oriented around that. Uh, to be extremely explicit, uh, this was designed by a brilliant person from the Democratic Republic of Congo. It was innovated by a person from Haiti. So at its core, this has been a pan-African movement of sorts that has been collaborative across multiple communities. Um, the vision has always been to try to bring the backpack, the technology to the continent to help communities start themselves up to be the manufacturers, the distributors, et cetera. We're not really interested in trying to uh, export and do it in that way. We're really interested in trying to build an ecosystem where communities can be self-sufficient and sustaining. Because there were two questions that our colleague from Uganda asked with respect to sustainability. The environmental sustainability side, I think which Dr. Minai talked about, as well as the sustainability of the ability for communities to maintain the technology and grow without others coming from the outside, if I understood your question fully. And so it's, we've been very intentional. I think that's why we've, we talk about digitalizing the grassroots and why we're talking about engaging with communities and building upwards as opposed to going from the top down. We're being extremely um, 
prudent in making sure that we are being cognizant of the need, even though there can be opportunities to launch this in 55 countries tomorrow, we want to be very keen on not losing sight of that. Dr. Minnight, if you want to add anything that I may have missed. Sorry. There's actually, again, I'm not, we're not here selling the pack, but there it does come in different versions. One called the light version that does comes without the satellite, which we make it much, much cheaper uh, than the version with the satellite. Second, it, with the pack itself, it's possible to connect like anything else. This is part of the dialogue from the beginning with the Internet Society that this is, you know, not a closed system. It's like connect your storage, connect your whatever it is uh, into this, boom, boom, it's part of the, your pack. You can add on whatever you want to it. It provides this sustainable connectivity, sustainable energy, little box. I promised Jane years ago, I haven't forgotten, that sooner or later there would be an open source version with open source hardware, and it's really hard to do that. Uh, there is a patented, on, on the, so is the software part that is, is patented last year, the manufacturer has that, that's just the reality of the world that we're in. Um, but, but still, um, the, the design itself is modular, simple, and can be added on in any way anybody wishes. There's nothing to stop people from adding in more content, more devices, other configurations. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. So, um, can you connect, is there a server? Why do you need a server? Um, I'm wondering what a community means, with a, like like an email server, for example. Suppose the connection is weak. Suppose like I want to send an email. I mean, it starts from there, but the idea of a community is all about how you are a community together. And I can give you 10 reasons, but I just, uh, I just want to mention email relay server. Yeah. Um, you can add, like as I said, if you want an email server, you can add an email server. This Has is a cloud edge a... solution, so it connects. It's it, there's a router, um, there's a battery, there's a solar panel. That's the core. Uh, there's a anyway. Those are the core components. Um, you can add anything else you wish. Uh, if you wish to have a separate router, that's optional, up to you. Okay. Has anybody added? in this Say again has anyone added a server until now there have been servers added but the basic design doesn't really require that um, so um, but you can do that another question hi thank you my name is Carlos Rey Moreno from the Association for Progressive Communications. Uh, thank you very much for the for the presentation. I mean, we've been advocating and supporting community networks for many years now with Jane and with others. It's actually amazing to see more people advocating and working and trying to to build the skills, the capacity, and and, and working with more communities around the world and in particular in in Africa. Um, I think uh, the, while while listening to you, there are there are some ideas that are coming to my mind, especially in relation to the f the funding no, or the financing of these initiatives that are related to, at the end of the day, the, sustain, the economic sustainability. I mean, we've been talking about the social sustainability, the technical sustainability, the environmental sustainability, which are all important, but in relation to, for instance, unlocking universal service funds, as I, I think Jane has a session tomorrow on that, or on Wednesday. I, I've lost track of with days today, I'm sorry. Um, the, the, the financial sustainability is important to unlock funding. You need to have some sort of a business model, an organization behind it, so there is some sort of a compliance and whatnot behind it in order to unpack either USF or finance from, you know, impact investors that might be interested in doing that. Um, and I'm one of the, the biggest, uh, you know, I really like the solution and I, I, I'm looking forward to spend more time with you during, during these days, understanding the entire setup. Uh, because there is a rebirth, an entire rebirth of community center, community centers that require connectivity that are owned by the community, kind of not the telecenter model that the governments were kind of topping down into the community, you know, like more, more top-down approaches that are not working and, and a rebirth of that movement and internet, so, you know, like internet connectivity solutions like that one could work. But then there is the issue of the cap of the OPEX. 
I mean, at the end of the day, for the entire thing that I just mentioned, and then you would require a license to be able to sell internet. So, it's, you know, it has like many elements, and uh, but then the OPEX in itself uh, is, is very complicated. I mean, we've been working for the last year or so in, in, in Nigeria with, with some some of our colleagues there and the and the element, even though they have the community centers from the from the government, the, there is no internet service provider whatsoever where costs are affordable for the community to maintain it and to pay, you know, a recurring cost of the of the of the OPEX, no? And uh, yeah, I was wondering whether I don't know, you were mentioning that you have a partnership with Imarsat, that in turn has been merged with Biasat, that Biasat has a partnership with Microsoft that is offering, you know, through Airband a potential opportunity to partner, whether you have considered that. Sorry, but many things, but happy to talk more. Thank you. Let's give you one um, minute to respond. Uh, sorry, uh, is that Kwaku on the line? Yes, yes, yes. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so nice seeing you, Carlos. Um, Kwaku here. Um, yes, so um, basically the whole reason is that we have this African Community Internet Program, um, Carlos, and it would be good for us to have more conversations about it and including the business models as we have um, incorporated in the program. And um, yes, there are a lot of developments going on and it would be good to us to continue this conversation and also um, for us to um, you know, tighten these um, aspects and the conversations very much. And we are very much welcome. And um, the team is available both online and on site in, um, in Kyoto. So let's keep the conversations going on. Yeah, thank you. I'll close this out by saying thank you all for being here. Carlos, to your question, um, we have a white paper that talks about the use and the importance of universal service funds, and we can connect with you afterwards to try to elaborate further. Uh, for those of you who were here with us in Kyoto, thank you so much for joining us. We want to give you a round of applause and give yourselves a round of applause, please. Don't be too shy, but clap for yourselves for being here. Um, for those who've joined us uh, virtually, thank you for coming. We wanted to make sure that we leave this conversation with you being able to access our, our website for more information, contacting us and engaging in the conversation, agcip.org. Um, we want to thank uh, Kwaku Antwi, Director of Programs and Research from the Africa Open Data and Internet Research Foundation, Jane Coffin, who is a Senior Executive for International Infrastructure and Internet Issues, uh, Jane uh, Apiochere, who is a doctoral candidate at Syracuse University School of Information Studies, Dr. Lee McKnight, who is an Associate Professor at the Syracuse University School of Information Studies, uh, the people of Japan uh, and the United Nations Internet Governance uh, Foundation. And please uh, do not hesitate to find our booth. We are right next to the kimonos. Thank you for coming. And with that, we will uh, end the discussion. <laughs>